This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, tech girl, Miriam Joar. Hi, and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joar, and today is Monday, March 12th, 2018. I'm at South by Southwest. My guest is Jason Harris of Tech Raver. Hi, Jason. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So as you can hear, my voice is not getting better since the last podcast. I'm still fighting a cold, and I think it's the MWC plague. So you'll have to bear with me today. I sound kind of like a young teenage boy. It's kind of exciting. Yes. I get to have a new personality today. So Jason, you and I have been doing South by for decades almost yeah. now. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what we saw and most importantly, what we didn't see. Yeah. We used to come for the hardware. Yeah, we used to come for hardware. BlackBerry would have a big thing, it w- it, whether it was phone focused or developer focused. Uh, we were just talking a second ago about how they used to have their BlackBerry house. And if you said you were a developer, they would throw a tablet at you. And it, it was like, and they were really trying to get that going. Now the, they're not doing that. Also, Google is down in that same area a lot. You know, it's Rainy Street. They used to always have a big presence. They do have a Google house. I haven't been there. I think it's more focused on voice now, not hardware. Yeah, they do have their little. Um, you know how at CS they did the monorail where they rebranded it with yes. the uh, you know Hey Google thing. They have these little uh, six seater golf carts yes. that they're driving electric golf carts around town. So <clears throat> not very exciting. But, you know, like, remember back in the day, Nokia used to come here? Yep. I mean, you used to work with them. Yeah, yeah. I actually did a, lots of, uh, about four or five activations with Nokia around South by one that you spoke at, which was awesome. Um, oh, yeah, that was like four years ago or yeah, something. Yeah, it was exactly four years ago. Facebook memories showed me the other day. Um, mm. Nokia would come. Samsung would always have a big thing. Like, even two years ago, they had a big thing just across from the commission center around Milk, their music service. Which I don't know if it exists. Does it exist anymore? I don't know. The only app or service that I've seen doing something is right at ACC. Title is doing an activation alongside with Mercedes about how you can get. You, yeah. Yeah. So Mercedes is definitely here in force. Absolutely. I know some journalists who have been invited to seeing some, you know, new prototype self-driving car and ride along or something. Um, I think these stories are going to come out. Like, don't quote me. I don't know anything because I'm not. I mean, I'm not under NDA or embargo. I just hear that. A lot of journalists came into town from Mercedes. Yeah. And they certainly have a big presence here, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, the, I think the biggest statement is hardware is dead. Like you said, there's no one here. Not not even affiliated companies trying to show off other things they do. They're just... So there's one hope left. Today is Tuesday. And yesterday, Monday, was the first day of the show floor. There's actually a show floor South by. A lot of people don't know that. And so I'm going to go check it out because if you got to find any hardware, that's where it's going to be. Yep. Absolutely. So what about you um, roaming around? What have you seen? If it's not hardware, what have you seen that makes South by you think? Is it still relevant? Should we even be here? I just I am a close friend of mine who used to come to South by with me. And I said, I think that next year is probably the year I'm going to hardly or give a hard consideration to not coming. The less people are coming. Um, my our techie friends aren't coming down anymore. They don't care. They've written it off. Um, so, yeah, I think it's actually jump the shark it's uh what i have seen here it seems like companies are really still trying to push vr and ar um they've we've we, you and i went to that event bit last year that was big the uh, what was it it was scobles event oh yeah VR. i can't remember what it was called that seems way more than a year ago to me maybe it was two years ago it's just but like my point is like everyone's been talking about ar and vr and everyone's still talking about it but you still haven't seen at least i haven't seen use cases where it's mainstream no, and that's the problem. I mean, I think we're in, in a place where the technology still has to grow to that level. Um, I mean, Bose is here, and I think we should talk about that. Bose, the company who makes headphones, um, mostly well-known for their uh, noise-canceling headphones for airplanes and flying, um, they have a pair of AR glasses that are really just headphones. They don't have, um, you know, visual, like they don't project images in your retina or anything. But I think that bone conduction or maybe, um, you know, speakers firing down kind of like, um, um, you know, Microsoft HoloLens. Yes. And they, they do AR using audio with, you know, uh, binaural positional audio. And so that's kind of an interesting thing. I've actually been, when I was at Dolby, when I worked at Dolby Labs, mm-hmm. I actually worked on an app, a prototype app, where we tried to do that. We, we, we would enhance Google Maps 
with positional audio. So if you were in your car and you had your phone docked through like, the headphone jack, or if you were using Bluetooth um, with headphones or whatever, the, uh, the the directions would tell you which way to go by telling you like... That's cool. The, the sound would come from like the left front speaker of mm -hmm. your car, or from, if you wore headphones, it sounded like it was you know over there to your right, uh, a little higher up. It is really kind of cool. And, and I think this, this, you know, it's situational awareness. You, rip, you respond much faster to audio cues yes. because it's fear or flight, right? Or yeah. whatever, flight or fight or yeah. fear or whatever it is. And, you, you know, like line is coming roaring at you. If you hear it from your left behind above you, you're going to look left yeah. up and go, oh, crap. And then you're going to start running. And I think that is, you know, why I think fighter jets have, I mean, Bose has been making professional audio uh, products for the airline industry for the the most of the pilots wear both headphones in the cockpit yeah uh, with noise cancellation and built-in mics and noise reduction and all that and so in fighter jets they've had this positional stuff for years i think since the 70s even it's like probably the tom kind of thing might have mm -hmm. been one of the first or the f-15 might have been one of the first that had the head helmet with binaural audio so they know where their, you know, their, their enemies are behind them uh, or above them or ahead of them. So I think it's cool that Bose is here because hard, we love hardware, but you're right. There's not much going on in AR still, you know, you saw the um, uh, project Vaunt or whatever it was from Intel. I did not know. Oh, I mean, you've heard of it is what I'm saying. No, I'm sorry. All right. Well, it is a, a pair of AR glasses that the team, the wearable team at Intel has been developing and they showed it to The Verge. They got the exclusive a few, like a month ago before MWC. And the guy behind this, uh, well, the, the guy heading the team, um, Itai Fonchak, he used to work with me at Pebble. He was the head of software and design. And he's really smart. And so what they're doing is they're kind of doing monochrome directly in the retina laser projection from these glasses that look no different than mine. Jeez right only on one eye only in the peripheral vision out of focus so it floats up ahead of you yeah and it's just pure notifications think pebble yeah it's only bluetooth there's no audio there's no vibration it's just super basic and because of that battery life is super awesome that would be great i and would so i would consider they're looking at marketing this eventually but to me this is what i'm saying whether this inflection point kind of like a, a saddle point in in technology where we have it's kind of like vr was in the 90s yeah we know we can do it we know what it's going to look like but we just don't have the tech yeah. to make it something that everyone can afford yeah well one thing i thought was interesting in the materials we were looking at on the bose stuff is that they were talking about reenacting historical events that sort of thing that would be cool to be like you could step yourself into the mlk speech and oh wouldn't and, be that amazing yeah and, and i you know I'm, I'm a dad so i've got kids that are learning like the immersive stuff for the learning for that sort of thing and then the other thing i was thinking about is um one of my side hustles is i'm a radio um radio reporter for a nationally syndicated travel show and i was thinking in the travel context being able to experience things and uh, before you while you're trying to choose it like say you want to do an airbnb you can check it out in vr before you book it that would be crazy yeah i mean i think you know honestly for me vr has always been a subset of ar like it's ar with the uh, eyes covered um, and so i'm kind of more interested in how ar develops because i think that miniaturizing ar because you really want to be able to wear it mm -hmm. is going to drive VR to be better. And I think right now, the only thing, you know, VR has certainly, you know, matured quite a bit since the nineties, but I still think that the reality is you have to really have a PC and, you know, a Vive or an Oculus um, and have the space in your house to really enjoy VR. Yeah. And that's a big ask. It's a lot of money. It's complicated. It's uncomfortable. You're sweating. It's hot. It's it's heavy. I mean, some people are willing to bear it, but for me, I think it's gonna be when it's just a pair of glasses. Yeah. And you maybe put like, you know, like um, one of those airplane, you know, soft masks yeah. on to to like stop the light, and boom, all of a sudden you're yeah. in VR, and uh, you take the, the little cloth thing off, and mm -hmm. boom, you're back in AR. Yeah. That's going to be the future yeah. because that's going to be, and it can, when it costs three hundred dollars, like a smartphone, then it's going to work. Mm -hmm. So I want to see that happen, and it's, we're still a little ways from that. Yeah, you know, so we'll see how it goes. But I think um, 
I think there's a lot of future for, for all that to happen yeah. still. So, and, and mobile VR is much more exciting to me. Like putting yeah. your phone into a pair of goggles, it's lighter. It's, you know, you get really good performance. The processors like the Snapdragon 845 are getting really, really good at this stuff. So I think the days of like the tether to a laptop, even a, a backpack laptop, as we've seen, is going to go away. Yeah. The, closing the loop on the Bose thing, one thing I thought was really cool is they've they've come out with the hardware concept now. They're launching a $50 million fund to get devs to do right. stuff on it. Mm -hmm. I think that is really smart. I hope that with that Intel thing you talked about earlier, I hope they're putting out some some sort of incentive. Yeah, so right now I think they're just keeping it in-house. They're trying they're, they're trying to develop it further until, and, and then they can open it up. And I think that's the next goal. But they wanted to see, they wanted to show to the world that this is a thing, we can make it real, that this making something that's no bigger than a pair of glasses with no compromises yeah. is real. Yeah. Like you cannot see like, the laser projector is like right there. Yeah. Right, right where the the arm meets the um, the glass. These are cool glasses. They bend in a weird way. But, um, you know, so basically it just like fires right into the corner of your eye. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, so that's all we saw at South by in terms of hardware. Um, I, you know, Mercedes obviously has some cars here. I mean, there is stuff, but it's just not like, oh my God, you need to be here. And, and I would argue that you don't even need to be here if you're into software. There used to be a time where this is where Foursquare launched. This is where Twitter launched. This is where Meerkat, I think, launched. Yep. I mean, those even those days are over. There's yeah. no app out there that I Bye. see that. I mean, you know, I do. I'm here as a uh, South by Southwest accelerator judge. And, you know, I see the startups at the accelerator and I'm like, yeah, no, there's nothing here. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't want to demean these people that have these really good ideas and they want to work really hard and they try to get funded. It's just that Some of them are good, but a lot of them are software as a service. A lot of them are like, you know, we're trying to optimize farmers um, workloads and, and, and really good stuff. But I'm not seeing like, where is the consumer sci-fi stuff that yeah. drives you and I? Where is the hardware stuff that drives you and I? I don't see it happening here anymore. It's shifted. It's more ententainment now. Like the biggest activation is this Westworld thing that HBO is doing where it's an immersive story. Someone was just telling me about it. That sounded cool. But yeah, in terms of like mobile geekery, not the place anymore. But you know what? There was one, there was a point in time about seven, eight years ago where I wrote off CES and MWC was it written off. It came back. Yeah, yeah. So... South by isn't, I, I, I'm not, it's not hopeless, but I'm hoping it changes soon. It needs to evolve. I think ultimately we have to also remember that it is, it was first a music show, then a music and film show, now a music, film and interactive show. And interactive is really the thing. And if you look at what this Westworld exhibit is about, it's interactive. True. And I think in that sense, they're staying true to their roots. I think it kind of got a little hijacked by the tech industry that saw an opportunity in the 2000s. And we kind of, we, we rode on the coattails of that yeah. as reporters. So I think perhaps we're bitching up the wrong tree. True. Um, I mean, ultimately, you know, if you're here for the movies and the, the films, there's tons of that going on. It's still really good. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about the... Um, some topics that I didn't cover with Fiona last week because we got a pretty complete podcast. Um, and one of them was this crazy phone called the Light Phone 2. This is what I'm stoked about. Yeah, so so you've seen what it is. What do you what do you think of that? First of all, what do you think of having a separate phone that either has a separate SIM that the carrier keeps active for you through the same plan, same number? You know they can do that now. Yeah. Like what do you think of the idea of having a second phone? Yeah, we're both Timo customers, yeah. So what do you think of that? I'm all about it. And the reason I'm all about it is because during the work week, I want to have my smartphone with both my work and personal emails and calendars and all that stuff. But on the weekends, I want to disconnect. Or actually, on uh, sometimes during the week, I want to disconnect too. And you know, I'm a dad, so I want to be present. I want to be there for my wife. So for me, it's all about disconnecting. Um, and But being able to have you know, being able to make a phone call. And I looked at the light phone, the original one, and I almost bought one, but I think it was like two, 250. And for me, that is a little too much for an extra phone. Yeah, I mean, it was stylish, and maybe you can justify the cost that way for some people. But I think the biggest problem for me with these phones in general, like I have a 3310 as well, yeah. you know, the 3G from uh, Nokia. And the biggest issue with that phone is, it's fun for five minutes. Right. Because even if you try to disconnect, 
you can't do text messaging because you don't have team. You you, you suck That's at T nine. Like I suck at T nine. I always did suck at T nine. So what do you do? I mean, ultimately you're kind of SOL. So you don't use it. You get frustrated and you you don't see how you can justify two hundred dollars. So what uh, Light Phone Two is doing, or what is it called? Is it called Light Phone Two? Yeah, Light Phone Two. So they're doing a touch screen with an e ink panel. So that kind of reminds me, yeah, with Kindles. a little bit of the um, the Yoda phone. Do you yes, remember that? Yes, I do. The second gen had a touch screen on the back as well, and then the the uh, Motorola, whatever it is, the the zombie the zombie phone, yes. the zombie apocalypse phone. I can't even remember the model number. I'm the one who was all gung ho about it. Basically, they took a e ink panel and made a touch screen, and so this thing now is still a dumb phone. But it has a touch screen, which is more familiar to people. And if you do want to do messaging with it, which the original supported by T9, this has a QWERTY keyboard in e-ink, which might be a little slow to respond, but at least won't be as frustrating for the average person today. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, a lot of people will argue that, oh, it's not a light phone anymore because it does messaging or it promotes you doing messaging. But I would argue that messaging is critical, right? It's very critical. I mean, if you want to disconnect and leave your smart at home, smartphone at home for the weekend, you still, you have a family, you have kids, you have a wife, you have, you know, commitments and important family things to deal with. You need to be able to send a message out and receive messages if something happens. That's true, yeah. And I think that's what they're seeing here. Yeah. And then, honestly, if I saw a phone that looks this sexy, uh, even if, you know, you know, if it's, especially if it was made as well as the original, I would, I would spend $200 on, yeah. the, on that because then it's like, okay, this is like a, a niche purpose made product that really nothing else can touch because the previous phone, I'm sorry, but Nokia had a whole bunch of really nice dumb phones that could compete with it at a much lower price point. Right? Yeah. Another use case that comes to my mind is parents. So I have a 10 year old and I would like to give her a phone for going to school. I don't want her running apps on it because we're not we're not there yet. Uh, but I want to be able to call her and message her and also right. having the battery last forever. Yeah, yeah. That, that's another use case. I would definitely buy one of these for for my 10 year old. So there you go. So check it out. I'll put the link in the in the in the um, podcast notes. Um, there is, you know, it just got announced. So it was it's pretty widely covered online. Um, the other set of uh, stuff I want to talk about is um, we touched on it a little bit last week was the G7 rumors or rather the rumors that there was a prototype of something that looked like it might be a G7 at MWC. I personally didn't see it. Somewhat but, side pocket. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so you're a G6 user and I know you're a big fan of the V30. In generally a big fan of LG. I am. So what are, your, what are your expectations? What are your dreams when it comes to the next flagship? I want... A slightly bigger screen than the G6. The G6 was a little small. Yeah. Um, I want it to feel as good as the G6 did in the hand, and I want I just I want the latest cameras. Um, right, my G6 is a year old, so I haven't been using it. I'm on a One Plus Five now, like personally speaking. Right. And I'm really tired of not having a top-notch camera. Um, but yeah, I like LG. I had a G4, a G5, a G6, and a V10 and a V20 over the years. And I just I love I love the company and it's nice having a third horse. We need a third horse in this race. Um, Samsung and Apple obviously leading the pack. Well, I like to think the third horse is Huawei. The, they are. I yes. mean, now they are. They, now they are. That's true. But I mean, for the U.S. market, that's still a tough sell. I mean, you're going to be able to walk into a, a carrier store and buy an LG G7, whatever it's called, when it comes out. Whereas, good luck finding a Huawei phone. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and for terms of expectations, uh, I want a better screen. I'm excited about the cameras. Um, having hopefully having the fingerprint reader on the back, like that is now the design language. Hoping that happens. Yeah, I have a feeling they're going to evolve the V. I think the V30 was a culmination of the best of LG. Honestly, mm -hmm. you, you owe yourself to get one. It is. I mean, I just have the new one now, the the 30s plus ThinQ. What a name, V30. S plus think Q and mine is 256 gigs of storage. Wow. Six gigs of RAM. Or I think I should check that. And of course the Snapdragon 835 and this, this amazing camera system and amazing audio. 
It's, it's exactly the same phone. It's just they put they maxed out the you know the storage cool. and they put a new AI based camera mm -hmm. app, which I'm really not seeing much out of because you know everybody's wanting to say AI, but really nobody's doing it as well as Google because nobody has the data sets to do it True. as well as Google. So to me, um, that's honestly the G6 was a great phone, but it was a great phone for like one hot minute for me. Yeah, because the thirty the thirty was like when it came out, I was like. You know, display issues aside, because it's the same, somewhat problematic display as the Pixel 2 XL. Although I have a feeling LG is keeping the better panels for themselves, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So it's slightly better. Uh, definitely the color calibration on that display is better than even the updated color calibration yeah. on the Pixel 2 XL. But to me, the V30 was, you know, really where it was at last year for LG. And, and I want to see more of that. I, I want to see... You know, I'm really gung ho about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, what, what else? We, I mean, you know, if you take a V30 and add a Snapdragon 830, 845 now, and go. maybe a better camera, is that all you really absolutely. want? Absolutely. Yeah. You want the headphone jack and the jack to this to I stay, right? Okay, jack. me too. I, I love my wired Bose. But headphones. here, I'm gonna throw a gun to that LG. I think we need more than that. Yeah. Because again, then you you're not differentiating. Because look, the Galaxy S9 just came out and. For better or for worse, it's just an evolution of the S8, but it's still, especially the S9 Plus, technically speaking, like pure hardware speaking, the best hardware in the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. So why, and we know LG can beat that, and this is what I'm thinking they can do. They need to put um, a third camera in the back, which we know Huawei is about to do with the P20. They need to put a third, hard, a third camera that is a zoom lens. So what I want to see is I want to see the wide angle, the regular, and the zoom. Mm -hmm. And then I want to see a portrait mode using the zoom because I don't even know if my, v, my V30S Plus has portrait mode, which is crazy. And the G6 didn't either. No, because it can't because it can't do it with a wide angle. Yeah. So, oh, I could do it with dual pixel autofocus, but I don't think it has that. Anyway, the point is that I want to see a third camera that's a telelens on the next G7. But the reason I don't think they'll do that is because there's a V40. And the V40 is the multimedia device. So maybe this year they're going to rechange the whole thing because how can they position the G7 as a flagship when the V always steals the show? That's true. You know, Samsung always has... The Note, in a way, steals the show too, but I think the Note is... It's a large a, phone with a stylus. It's a different class of user with expectations. The V30 and G6 have way more overlap. And that's my concern. And I think LG needs to find a way to differentiate. They need to find a way to further make the V series a multimedia series and further make the G series a flagship. And how do you do that? Maybe you don't do that. You maybe can't. you reinvent the whole thing. And maybe that's why we didn't get a G7 and MWC because they're trying to come up with a new strategy and maybe we won't have two phones this year. Yeah. Maybe we'll have a V40 G7 combined mm -hmm. and it will be called the VG6. The VGX. Yeah. That sounds like some 80s, well, you know, version of a Mitsubishi car oh, or yeah. something. And then that's one other thing I want to talk about real quick. Why have we gone back to these really terrible product names? The <laughs> P10 Mate Plus, like... I don't. Oh, I just. Man. I don't get it. If they've got, we've got, we've gone like Nokia Lumia fifteen twenty, Nokia Lumia nine twenty, all these things. And I worked for Nokia and still actually own them. So I and I love them. But we're going back to these crazy product names. I don't. I don't get it. So what do you want to see? Like Atrix. I guess. I mean, you want to see word names? Yes. Okay. Simple, like so that when we're talking about a phone, we know it. But like you're you're trying to describe the bigger LG right now. You just got it recently, and you can't even remember the product name. Well, it's just a really unwieldy product name. Yeah, but we're getting a lot of those now. So yeah, I think you're right. It's the, the names, I mean, this is an extreme case, I think, and it's very, very Korean, you know, very LG. It's like, let's throw a bunch of stuff. So ThinQ, they announced that CS was gonna be their AI brand, mm -hmm. like Big Spi is for, you know, all things AI from, uh, from Samsung. So as a result, they, they tacked on the Think. Q. But I think the the S is really the variant here. Like because there was a V30 plus 
Okay, Sprint has it as an exclusive in the U.S. and it's available in other markets. Okay, it's I got it's it's a V30 with more uh, more uh, storage, cool. 28. So that's not unusual. V30, V30 Plus. They had a G6 Plus as well, mm -hmm. which was more storage and had the quad DAC. Yeah. In some markets, and then you know, so now you do V30s and V30s Plus, right? Yeah. But then, because they have this AI stuff in there, they added ThinQ. And then they give me the top of the line one, which is a V30S Plus, because of the storage, ThinQ. That's the rationale. It's BS. It sounds yeah. terrible. We don't want to deal with it. But hey. So, but Galaxy S9 Plus is, a little, is getting a little heavy, too. Pixel 2 XL. I don't know. iPhone 10 iPhone X, a lot of people say that. That's one at South by, I've been amazed, that it's going back to South by, how many iPhone 10s I've seen. Oh, it's everywhere. I have one in my pocket too. Yeah. I'm a defector. No, I'm joking. Um, you know, actually, I want to give uh, a bit of um, kudos to Marques Brownlee at MKBHD because he, he just talked about this. He did a thing on the Apple ecosystem to try to explain to people who don't understand if you're in the Android world you don't understand it's like what are you talking about like why people why do people like these iPhones so much it's a really good video oh cool yeah he's been off the charts for the last year or two. Oh man yeah he's, he's doing some good work yeah he's got game um, yeah so I think what else is there I, I think we're, naming we talk about name I don't know how we can improve those names though yeah, I think you're right. There's just too many. There's too many. There's too many phones. Then they have to differentiate them somehow. I think the Galaxy brand is a solid brand. Absolutely. I think, you know, the G series seemed to work for LG. The idea of a G series and a V series, well, okay, I think V and a number and G and a number is not so bad. Galaxy S. The, the S, I think they should have dropped it, you know. Mm -hmm. It should be just Galaxy something. Yeah. They, they did the Galaxy Alpha. They had Galaxy, you know, Note. I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like, I do. So they, they need to have something. I don't know. They're not going to go away from that. It's such a big brand for them. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked about high-end. We talked about LG. And now well, let's talk about mid-range. Oh, yeah. Mid-range. It's a, it's a happy party in the mid-range. Actually, let's talk about... I want to segue into it. So let's oh. talk about OnePlus. You're a OnePlus 5 user. I have am. you played with a 5, the new one, the 5T? I have not seen a 5T yet. Well, basically, it's the 5 with an 18.9 display and the fingerprint in the right place. Which is great. Um, it's, fingerprint it's a reader beautiful, the, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful phone, I think. I mean, I think for me, I can't deal with a phone that has a fingerprint reader in the front anymore. Mm -hmm. It's annoying. It's really annoying. Yeah, the only, so, the only saving grace for the OnePlus 5 for me being up front is it, but it is lightning fast. Oh, yeah. It's so fast. And they, they, to their credit, they did come out with Face Unlock for the 5T and 5. And it's pretty good. Yeah. It's actually the best after Face ID I've used. Now, we have to, I know there's people already like getting onto their keyboards and commenting madly. We know the difference, okay? Face ID is real 3D mapping of the face, depth sensing, and that's why it can be used for payment and banking and stuff. It's way more you know, strong authentication and harder to hack. Whereas the Face ID that, you know, OnePlus is doing and also um, Huawei is doing the Honor View 10 is purely optical using, looking at distances between your eyes and your mouth. And, you know, it doesn't actually do a 3D mapping. And it's, you know, can be fooled by a photo in some cases, but it's much better than what Google gave us with Ice Cream Sandwich. Yes. Which has been in every Android phone since Ice Cream Sandwich, by the way, face and, uh, unlock. But it's, you know, you can't use that seriously for authentication, which is why it's a nice complementary technology for the fingerprint reader on the 5 and the 5T and the, v, the View 10. And I think almost every new Huawei and Honor phone that's come out in the last, you know, well... Uh, since since the holidays, actually, because yeah, there's a bunch of new ones that keep getting announced. Yeah. Like, it's changing the Mate 10 Pro doesn't have it, yet there's no reason for it not to have it. But the View 10 has it, mm -hmm. and anyway, yeah. the 7X, I think, might be getting it. So, yeah, um, I want to hear your thoughts on the, uh, what's the word, the tierification of yeah. the smartphone business. It's clear to me that flagships are now the premium phones, not just, because you know, you can get a OnePlus for $500 that is almost nearly as good as a flagship that costs twice as much. So why would you spend, you know, more money on the flagship? 
At this point, the question becomes, do you want to spend the money? And in the US, it's a no-brainer because the carriers are involved. People walk into a Verizon store, an AT&T store, and uh, they don't care because they're going to subsidize it, yeah. so they're going to get the best. They're making money. And payments. I think, actually, as a matter of fact, I think that's why the mid-range is not successful like it is in Asia and in Europe through carriers because the subsidies are much bigger in the US. In in Europe, if you want to get a Galaxy S9 subsidized, you have to cough up 200 up front, plus, you and know, the monthly years. payments are starting to get really, really hairy. And a three-year so, service you agreement. know, and but you have the choice to get like an Honor 7X or some mid-range, like a one, maybe not a one plus, but something equivalent yeah. to that for, you know, a hundred down. And that makes a big difference. Whereas in the US, it's like, oh, you know, you the buy one, get one, you know, is kind of like the thing that, yeah. you know, gets people in the stores. And, and I get it. So I'm not sure that's ever going to, the mid-range is ever going to be popular and successful in the US. But it exists and it exists unlocked and in a state that it exists I think it's very attractive it is very attractive it's for for people who know about it because they know geeks like you and me they love it so my brother-in-law he has like he bought a one plus or an honor 6x last year um, yeah his android had failed him and he didn't even know about it and I said hey like for 250 dollars on Amazon you'll get it in two days he loves that phone the only the only gap the only thing that people have to go with is um, it's not getting um, it's not getting all the updates. So and that's like that, that, honestly a problem with the galaxies too. I mean, that's, I think, you know, I've been saying this a lot, but one of the things I really want to hammer on the, the manufacturers and carriers this year is we need your phones to get updated. Yeah. Like this has become the most simple, like I'm going to dock you seriously in my reviews. If you don't provide updates for your phones in a timely manner, I don't really care how awesome your phone is. And you know, you and I and other people like the listeners of this podcast often buy our phones unlocked because, you know, we, we want the updates faster and we want, you know, no bloatware and we want to own the terminal, yep. as it were, in the carrier speak. So, you know, for me, OnePlus is doing a really good job and the 500 pri price point is very interesting. It's not that crowded yet, really. We have, yeah. we have OnePlus really owning that area and then we have now Huawei with the Honor V10 or View 10. And we have possibly a few others coming in this year, but the super competitive segment, and as you alluded to already with your friends uh, 6X, uh, is the Honor, uh, the 200 price point with the Honor 7X, mm -hmm. the Honor 9 Lite in Europe, which I have in my pocket right now. The Zenfone. Uh, the Zenfone. What else is there? There's... Lots. In oh, fact, the, the, all the, the motor phones. The, the G5 phones. last yes. year. Now the G6 coming. Uh, there's this whole bunch of different G5 models. They're all like and the one you showed. G5 S Plus. The red one you showed. Oh me. yeah. So let's talk about Noah. Thank you. Yeah, Noah is. Uh, an interesting, I was in Zagreb's Croatia. You know, being the keynote speaker at a conference, a tech conference there a month ago. I just posted on my Twitter, by the way, the uh, video of that keynote. So you check it out. It's it's pretty interesting, and. Um, I met this company, this company exec there, who was a marketing guy for this company that makes smartphones for the creation market. I was like, there is such a niche thing. He goes, yeah, you know, pricing is very critical. It's highly competitive here. You know, the, the carriers are uh, obviously very popular uh, as a destination to buy phones, but uh, there's a good, healthy, unlocked market. So we saw the opportunity a few years back. We started making cheap Android tablets um, you know, we sourced them from China and had them made and we built these really good relationship with these Chinese manufacturers. And then when time came, we were like, you know, we can compete with the Galaxy A8 and the, you know, LG, whatever it is, mid range that are sold by these carriers and make a phone that is in this $200, 200 euro range that kicks serious ass. Mm -hmm. And so at the time he showed me what I have in my pocket, which, which you should look for the video on my YouTube channel, the Noah N8. And that's the current flagship on paper um, be, because the other ones were announced at MWC and they're not out yet. Yeah. But the, the N8 is basically, looks like an Honor 7X or OnePlus 5T. It's, it's, very it's got nice. the 189 display. It's got dual cameras in the rear. It has a really cool 5,000 milliamp hour battery, USB type C. That's an interesting differentiator. The right. Massive battery. Yeah. And and sadly, no headphone jack, but it does have an adapter in the box. And it has um, a MediaTek 
like a pretty high end, I think an eight core, 10 core MediaTek with LTE, dual SIM, micro SD expansion. I mean, it feels fast. It's a pretty clean build of Android. Um, I have the Google Now launcher on there, but even their default launcher is pretty clean. Cool. Um, and their big thing, thing is that they promise, uh, tw like I think a 12 month of, um, we replace it no matter what. Oh, wow. Like you crack the screen, you drop it, it's, it gets wet. Wow. Like they have this really great poly warranty. Mm -hmm. Now, updates, I don't get a feeling they're too hot on updates. So even though you get a clean build of Android, this is 7 on the Nova N8, but the new phones I saw at NWC had, all had 8 on them. That's great. So obviously, they try to be pretty good at the latest version. But what I've been mostly impressed with these phones is that they're not, well, they're made in China by a partner, but they're not Chinese branded. They're meant to this small market, Croatia, and they've now expanded into Hungary and Bulgaria and Romania. So all of the Eastern, the former Eastern Bloc is, is, their, is their playground. And Russia is a big market for them as well. And it turns out that they're able to make these beautiful, so this phone is all metal, aluminum unibody. They, they make these beautiful aluminum and glass phones that have pretty high end specs and the latest technology and the latest build of Android, pretty uncluttered for a reasonable price. And I got that, I found that very exciting because we have nothing that's homegrown like this. Yeah. Like Wiley Fox exists in the UK. One exception, in focus. They're making they're making, they're making phones. phones. Yes, in focus. I used to work for them, so like I I, I watch their news. But still. I've never seen their they're phones. They're in India. But the Ah, in India. Yeah. But not in homegrown, I mean, in the U.S. Oh, no, you're right, you're right, you're right. There's tons of little companies. That, like, uh, India has a bunch of their own manufacturers That's that true. do the Chinese connection. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about, in Europe has others, like Wiley Fox in, in the U.K., which yeah. I think is going out of business. Yeah, right? they are. But but the thing is, I, they gave me their two, their first two original phones, so I should probably keep them mark. and put them in a museum. Yeah, is it Mark? Yeah. Cool. Anyway, so the point I'm getting to is that it's nice to see phones that are kind of generic you can clearly make they're clearly made by some the same factory somewhere I, in china i was blown away that thing yeah. but it's nice the, right no it's um, beautiful and so the three phones they announced at mwc and i have videos for these on my uh, on my channel and of course i wrote about them in pocket now um are the n10 which is going to be the new flagship, which, get this, has the same display as the Zenfone 5 oh, wow. and 5Z with the notch yeah. and the little ch weird chin at the bottom. That's interesting. So clearly the same supplier, 1080p yeah. panel. And as a glass sandwich, as glass back. Uh, then they have a NOAA N7, which is a little cheaper than the N8 uh, and competes more with the, um, what's it called, the, uh, the Honor 9 Lite. And then it, they have an N1, which is kind of like entry level. But yeah. it's cool because imagine this. It's like a Moto E4. Yeah. Imagine an old Moto E4 glass sandwich. Yeah. Like oh, that's cool. Real glass. Well, I'm, I'm not sure it's real. It might be, it might be um, acrylic. But, you know, metal frame, acrylic back, maybe glass front. 89 display, only 720p. Some crappy MediaTek, but it still has 4 GLT. Um, 2 gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of storage. That not sounds much. cool. But like the same price point, 150 bucks yeah. as an E4. That's, so that's kind of what got me, me excited about. It looks really hot too. So that's kind of where, um, you know, where things are interesting these days is the mid range. So let's talk about the Honor 9 Lite because, you know, it's kind of like I talked about it with Fiona a little bit. I, I want to reiterate this. I've been gung ho about the 7X because it's such a great phone for the money for 200 in the US unlocked. Bang you can't go buck. wrong. But imagine, what if I told you there was a phone that was better for the same price? It's 179 Euro, euros, which is about 200 US dollars. We'll buy you That's the exciting. Honor 9 Lite, which brings back the glass back that we had on the Honor 8, yes. which we loved. Adds a dual front camera in addition to the dual rear. Same processor, same guts. Adds NFC, which is missing on the 7X. And it's a slightly smaller physical size yeah. so it feels better in hand it's more like an iphone 10 yeah. than a one plus yeah which is you know the one plus 5t and the 7x are almost dead ringers for each other mm -hmm. in size so there you go i mean huawei competes with itself in this really weird way uh honor i would say competes, competes with, with itself, itself. Where? I, I would actually argue that the view 10 and the 7x don't make sense to me yeah because if you look at them side by side 
They're almost identical. The only difference is the fingerprint reader is in the front on the View 10 for whatever reason. Yeah. And in the back on the 7X, yet, and the specs are very different, right? Because the View 10 is, is Kirin 970, which is the same as the Mate 10 Pro, whereas, you know, the, the, the 7X is like a 600 series Kirin. It's another yeah. simpler mid-range one. But you look at them side by side and you're like, why should I spend 500 bucks for this phone that looks exactly like this better, this phone that's better priced? Yeah. And so I think Honor or Huawei is doing a lot of what Samsung did back in the day of like throwing a bunch of Absolutely. darts and seeing where they yeah. land and hoping for the best. It's kind and, of crazy. And we win. So you said 179 euro where it's obviously. So you can't buy it in the US. You can probably import a great market. The thing is the reason I don't want you to get all excited right now and go on Amazon, buy one like or eBay, because in the US it has very limited 4G LTE support. Oh. So it'll be stuck on 3G on AT&T and T-Mobile a lot. And you don't want that. No. Whereas the NOAA actually works on LTE a little more. So again, the NOAA is the same thing. The one, don't buy that NOAA N8, even as if it's cool, don't, because you're not gonna be able to use an LTE in the US very yeah. much. But that being said, it's you nice know, if you're in Europe, if you're in Asia, I would look at these phones, especially the Honor 9 Lite. I, it is delightful. I ended up buying one for my mom. Oh, wow. That's great. Because she needed a new phone. And get what? Her operator sells it. They just started selling it the week of MWC. Oh, cool. So while I was there, I said, Mom, go order that online because they don't have it in stock anywhere in yeah. any store. And she did. And I set it up for her and she loves it. She came from like a really shitty low end galaxy, like mm -hmm. galaxy something, something boring, something, boring, yeah. plasticky crap, crap, right? Mm. It was slow as hell. Oh, yeah. Well, now she's got a premium glass backed phone. Yeah. And, like, and it, it came with this with a plastic um, sleeve, you know, like a, a, a snap on plastic yeah. back, transparent, that still shows you the beautiful looks of the phone. That's great. But um, protects it from yeah. pops. So all in the box and it has a headphone jack, you know, so boom. Yeah. So what else are we so, going to see in the mid range this year? I think we're going to see Moto's G6 series really hammer away. We might see under under finger under display fingerprint readers on those phones. Did you see any of those at MWC? No, they're they're not around. I thought I saw. They're all rumors. Say, okay, my bad. I thought at I this saw. point, there's also um, ZTE last year gave us a Blade V8 Pro, mm -hmm. which competed with the six X Honor six X, and there was a Blade V9 announced at, at MWC. I did a video on my channel, um, and that one is. It's not like the Pro, so it's lower end, it's Snapdragon 400 based, but if they do a Pro version of that, it'll compete directly with the 7X. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if sometime in the next month or two for the US market, ZT announces an unlock competitor to the 7X called the, v, the Blade V9 Pro. Whether you want that or not, I don't know. I mean, the Axon 7 was really an awesome phone from ZT for yeah. a long time. For a and year uh, and Yeah. So, Let's talk more mid-range. How much do you know about Alcatel? I don't. I've, I know of them. So, I don't know uh, have you ever played with the Idol 5? I have not. Okay, so the Idol 5 was also a bit of a darling of a phone in the mid-range for a lot of people. And they announced three new phones at uh, MWC, which I did hands-on with. Uh, you know, Brad now is the head of PR there. Oh, really? Brad Molin at Alcatel. Yeah, yeah for TCL him. Alcatel. So that's exciting. Uh, and uh, he, uh, you know, got me a chance give me a chance to play with these phones and they're a little too plasticky for my liking like they're not metal and glass they're some one of them looks like glass in the back but it's clearly acrylic mm -hmm. i mean you know whatever like the the htc u11 life or whatever it was called it was a u11 redux clone with yeah. plastic body and fake acrylic glass in the back so you know if you've got if you've got to do that you got to do that i just wish like now that huawei has shown you can still make metal and glass phones at 200 dollars. i kind of want everyone to make metal and glass do premium you, looking phones at 200 dollars. do you think that huawei has eaten htc up well yeah i mean look huawei has been big for a long time it's just that they haven't been on the radar of mm -hmm. the west for oh, well europe yes but not north yes. america it's only recently with Last year, them selling the Mate 9 unlocked in the US, the Honor 8 tried the year before that, uh, and then, you know, their attempt to sell it with carriers, the Mate 10 Pro, uh, I, I said the Mate 9, right? 
Yeah, so last year they sold the Mate 9 Unlocked. This year they're selling the Mate 10 Pro Unlocked. And they tried to get it in the carriers. And because of that, they're really at the forefront of the news cycle. But you and I have known Huawei for a while. We've yeah. known they made really nice flagships. For me, it was, you know, the Mate 8 and the P9 were really where I started to see like, wow, okay, I've been missing out on Huawei phones. They're really amazing. Mm -hmm. And then the Mate 9 really further reinforced that. The P10, P10 Plus last year. And then I got the Mate 10 Pro. And the Mate 10 Pro is like, we're talking like, super top tier like yeah. one of my top five that's what you've been shooting with on your road trip yeah right? one of my top fives of 2017 yeah so it's it's a really solid phone and and i think the mate 20 not mate 20 sorry the p20 that's coming out um it's gonna be announced in paris march 27th is going to be very interesting. It's got three cameras in the rear. Oh, wow. And how, how do those work? Well, we don't know, right? I mean, it's all leaks and rumors, but um, we assume that it's the the same dual uh, sensor system they have now for for depth of field, which is a 12 or 13 megapixel um, auto uh, color autofocus with large pixels uh, with OIS, and then a 20 megapixel monochrome with mm -hmm. OIS, and then... That's what they already have. And then they are adding a telephoto to that. Oh, wow. So that's kind of what I think is going on. And it's got the notch display. It's got a notch display, but it doesn't look like the notch display from the Zenfone 5. So it looks like it might be full screen like the iPhone. And that notch looks big enough that it might be the first Android phone to have a full on face ID competing yeah. face recognition with 3D mapping which means it will have a fingerprint reader probably, but you'll have the actual choice yeah. of using one or the other. Well, that's what I was wondering. And using for payment one or the yeah. other. You and I were talking about what innovations could come to mid-range. That's the thing that came to my mind. I wanted to ask you about if you'd seen anything at NWC where they're doing... Well, face, face ID is everywhere, even in the mid-range, but it's like really fake face ID. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's the stuff we saw on OnePlus 5. It's better than the ice cream sandwich face ID, but it's not usable for payment. So that's definitely a staple of mid-range. 18 by 9 screens are everywhere, and even at the low range now, which is cool. Yeah, And I the notch, that. we're going to see so much notch, it's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, which, the notch. which pains me and excites me, whatever. Uh, it's, just, it's just funny to see the everyone bad-mouthing Apple, and then now everyone's replicating it six months later. Of course they are. And, and I mean, I think is you know, Zenfone 5 is definitely the biggest offender of that so far. But you have to put yourself in their position, right? In Asia, you know, it's a common thing that you want to buy the expensive phone, but you can't afford it, so you want to buy a kind of a copy clone. Yeah. And so there's a market for it, so why not seize that opportunity, right? I'm, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to shit on Asus. Like, I think they do some good stuff, and it's a good-looking phone. I just think that it is a bit too clony in the same way as I think the OnePlus Five was looked like a clone of the iPhone. Absolutely. Uh, Seven Plus, mm -hmm. and you know, it's a little disappointing when they don't really go all the extra mile yeah. in their design, especially Asus because they have. A history of really solid yeah. in-house design but hey look you know if you're gonna make money and you think you're gonna make money i can see there's a potential you know selling point there yeah. so so what excites you what's of, a, of the other stuff that's coming up we've talked about lg we've talked about huawei what do you think we're going to see in the note 9 i think it's going to get a half an inch bigger um and i'm even bigger than now i think so it's a I'm, big phone people like i i haven't played with one for long term, but I have, but I have, but I have seen them. I think because the S8 or S9 Plus is is so close. Yeah, yeah. I so I think it'll get bigger. People, I, people love those phones. It was so interesting. To, it's interesting to me how the S, you know, the S7 was was a dud, but now they're back and they're like Samsung's killing it with the Note and the GS. Or well, GS they kind of had to after that whole fiery <clears throat> Note 7 fiasco. But at the same time, I knew it. I knew they were going to come back big. In fact, the moment it happened, I was like, oh, this is bad, but this is just a one-off thing and it's going to make them stronger because they'll have to really prove themselves. Yeah. And we've seen that. The Galaxy S8 was a delightful phone. I have to say it was the first Android phone from Samsung that I didn't want to throw against the wall yeah. within the first hour of using because... The, it was genuinely pleasant to use, even with all this embellishment stuff. Yeah. It isn't still slowing down the phones a little too much for my liking. Yeah. If and you're used to OnePlus, 
You know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. That phone just doesn't slow down. It's fast. It's wicked you fast. You know, another phone that's wicked fast is all the high-end Huawei's, like the Mate 10 Pro. Mm -hmm. Holy crap, that phone is fast. And, you know, the iPhone 10 feels fast. The Pixels, they generally start out feeling fast, and they slow down a little bit. My 2XL still feels pretty snappy. But I have to say, Huawei maintains their snappiness over time, and I think OnePlus does too. Yeah. And... Uh, it's always refreshing because the galaxies, oof, for the, you know, you compare them side by side with a one plus and you can really see a bit of lag. Yeah. And, um, and I wish that wasn't the case. I just know? gave my best friend, my old one plus three and he, he was new to it. He came from a J seven, like a mid, you know, mid range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He loves it. He loves his one plus three. Of course so he does. He's so excited about it's it. It's a solid phone. So yeah, I think uh, I think it's going to be an exciting year. I'm trying to think of what else. We're going to get new iPhones this year. Um, in the near future, though, it's going to be Huawei P20, and then uh, the G, the, the Motos when they come out. There's going to be also a new series of Z phones from Moto to replace the Z2 Force and the Z2 Play. Yeah, we're going to see a three. I'm pretty sure we're going to see a Z3 Force and Z3 Play. And the leaks and rumors so far show. 18 by 9 screen, so no more fingerprint reader in the front. So where you put the fingerprint reader, because you can't put it in the back because of the mods. So I always thought it might be on the power button on yeah. the side like Sony did, yeah. or Nextbit did, or Razer that. did. Uh, but then I thought, wait a minute, under the display fingerprint reader, maybe that's the opportunity there. Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, basically, the things I'm excited about other than the triple camera phones uh, like the P20 is which phone will be the first Android phone, whether it's Huawei with the P20 or Samsung with the Note 9 to bring us a real Face ID competitor in the front that can be used for Google Pay. That will be the big, the big one. And then who is going to be the first to make a full screen no notch, no nothing phone. I don't think it's going to happen in 2017, 18. But I think 19, we're going to see somebody. Maybe Xiaomi. Somebody's going to make a phone. Where do you, where do you put the speaker? Well, you could put it in a tiny little slit like the, the Mi Mix 2, which I have. You know, the, the Mi Mix original had basically a full screen display with a tiny chin. And the camera was in the chin. And then... They had no speaker and it was piezo like the kyocera mm. phones remember yeah. those yeah and then the, that was didn't work out that well so the second gen they put a tiny little slit basically where that little piece of plastic shock absorber is between the glass mm -hmm. and the frame or the ceramic or whatever it is mm -hmm. they're using and it's barely there so they could do that the question is, where do you put the front-facing camera? And Vivo showed us at MWC, you make it extend out. Like, they had a mechanical, oh, yeah. it, like, slid out, like, like a little you know, pop, oh, okay. electric. A little pop up. And it so retracts. So you could do that. And I wouldn't put it past Xiaomi, because Xiaomi, you know, they're, they're yeah. the first ones to really try to push this. Yeah. How much screen can we put on a frame of a phone, uh, in a chassis of a phone? And then, you know, Essential did the notch. Uh, well, the, it's not really a notch because I think of notch as more of a rectangle trapezoid thing. Mm -hmm. So the circle, I guess. And then, you know, Apple certainly made the notch. And then Asus is following suit. Um, you know, Noah, that company from Croatia, the N10 has the same display as the Zen Phone 5. So I don't know. If, I think we're going to see tons of notches this year. But next year, I want to see the first Full phone screen. that like, just like you hold it and the whole thing is a screen. Yeah. And that's going to be like sci-fi come true to me. I'm, I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's basically it for the show. I think there's going to be some, you know, I think MWC is over. A lot of people came to M to South by. We're going to start getting more phone news uh, as the month, you know, continues. Because I think people have been, there's been a bit of, there was a bit of a vacuum after MWC. Um, and then, Which you was know, just two weeks ago. A distraction after the distraction of South by. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get more phone news for you guys next week, I think. But hey, you know, in the meantime, check out all my YouTube videos. There's a lot. I post a lot of YouTube videos. I have an entire playlist of YouTube videos from MWC you should watch. Um, they're all about three minutes each and there's at least, I think, 15 of them. So Perfect. you can spend like 45 minutes watching some, uh, some crazy videos of me ranting and raving about stuff. And uh, I'll put in the link description, uh, all the stuff we talked about. But more importantly, uh, check out my stories on Pocket Now about the Noah phones. It's cool. Jason, 
Where can people find you online? Yeah, so on Twitter, I can be found at HarrisJA. Uh, my blog is Tech Craver, like a fat man craves candy, techcraver.com. And then also, if you want to hear more of me um, recorded style, I have a radio show that I do once a month called Rudy Max's World. I'm his tech correspondent. That's very cool. Um, you know, I always thought I was tech raver, like a tech raver, you know, boop de doo boop de doo No, I get that. Um, yeah. No. Okay, well, that's too bad. Uh, Craver, okay, that makes more sense. So you guys know where to find me. I'm at Tankerl on Twitter and on Instagram. That's T-N-K-G-R-L. It's like the comic book character, Tank Girl, just drop the vowels and you get it. And then uh, my YouTube channel, I couldn't get that that handle. So it's just youtube.com slash Miriam Joar. Please go there, check out the videos, as I said. Subscribe, like, tell your friends. Uh, and then, uh, of course, there's this podcast, mobiletechpodcast.com. And uh, um, I want to thank World Podcasts for being the hosts of the show and the producers. And I also want to thank our sponsor, Audible. So if you guys like books like I do, but you don't have time to read them because you're always on the road, get yourself an Audible account because you can listen to books, audiobooks on the go, anytime, anywhere. And uh, it's really, really convenient. Uh, right now, I'm on a giant binge of the Star Wars uh, the Last Jedi, 11-hour audiobook, uh, perfect for this road trip because we drove my spouse and I out here to South by in Austin and we're driving back. So we're kind of halfway through and, uh, you know, it's really well done. So Audible is the place to go for audiobooks. If you like books like I do, but you don't have time to read them and you want to listen to them instead, um, go and check out audible.com. And uh, there's a link for that. Uh, audibletrial.com slash mobile tech that's audibletrial.com slash mobile tech uh, stay tuned for next week's show we'll have another guest and more mobile phone adventures cheers everyone bye this has been the mobile tech podcast with tank girl proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com you can visit us online at mobiletechpodcast.com